The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 11th chapter. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one whom knocks, the door will be opened. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I first want to just take a moment to thank Brett and Marita Wolgast for being here today. Uh, they are very dear friends of, of Allison and mine. Uh, we go back about 30 years. So um, they are on staff at uh, First Lutheran Church. And if you ever have a chance to go worship at First Lutheran, please do. But uh, I just wanted to tell them how much it means to me for them to be here today. So, <clears throat> my question for you is, where did you learn how to pray? Do you remember that? Our parents, your parents may have taught you bedtime prayers or said grace before meals. Maybe you learned about prayer in Sunday school or listening to great sermons like the ones you're going to hear right now. <laughs> Maybe you learned about prayer through your participation in worship. In worship, we experience prayer as the gift of participation. When we pray together as the body of Christ, we believe our prayers join Christ's prayers to the Father, inspired by the Spirit. For many of us, our knowledge of prayer has been obtained in bits and pieces over the years, and yet our comfortability with prayer can be as different and as unique as the person praying. Where one person feels comfortable praying out loud, the other person might prefer to keep their prayers to themselves, holding them close to their heart where only God can hear them. Now, when I was but a child, my mother read this very passage to me, and I remember I was really struck by the disciples' very bold and assertive statement to Jesus about prayer. But somehow, I either misunderstood or was not listening very closely, because what I thought I heard was something like this. Connor, can you go to the next slide? And the disciples told him, teach us how to play. Well, I have since grown up, <laughs> gone to seminary, and I think I have this straightened out now, although there are days when I play so poorly that I ask God to teach me how to play. But more often than not, I end up just asking to be forgiven about how I pray, play. 
can go to the next one, Connor. All we really know for sure is that Jesus commands us to pray and tells us to ask, search, and knock. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who searches, finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. This is perhaps the most difficult part of the passage to preach because our life experiences often contradict Jesus' words here. So often we have asked and not received, searched and not found, and knocked only to find disappointment that no one answered the door. Now sadly, in spite of our most fervent prayers of asking, searching, and knocking, we have lost loved ones to illnesses like cancer and to things like senseless accidents. And in spite of the continual fervent prayers of people asking, searching, and knocking right here in our community and around the world, we continue to hear of tragedies of violence, hunger, disease, and natural disasters. There are no simple answers to the question as to why our prayers seemingly go unanswered, though simple answers are often given. One answer is given that it, is only, it only seems as though God has not answered our prayer. God always answers, but sometimes says no. There are times, perhaps, when that could be the case. Scripture bears witness to God's will that everyone has enough to eat and that violence and war cease. Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer to pray for daily bread and for God's kingdom to come. Yet millions continue to go hungry and wars rage on. When we pray, we may not be asking for the wisest things. And so to be a truly loving God, God must refuse our request. Yet this explanation cannot account for the many times that we have prayed as we just knew that our requests surely aligned with God's will. Another explanation often given to the problem of unanswered prayer is that everything happens for a reason. God is some purpose in planning everything that happens. No matter how bad it may seem, it is all part of God's plan to bring about some higher good. Now for me, this is a little bit troubling, to say the least, because it holds that for whatever happens, whatever happens must be God's will. One would have to say then that all kinds of evil, such as violence and torture and starvation and premature death, are all the will of God. Yet the truth is God can bring good out of evil. Indeed, this is our ultimate hope, the heart of our faith. It's our belief in Jesus' death and resurrection. But that is quite a different thing from saying that whatever evil thing happens is God's will. And we believe what Scripture tells us, that God is all-powerful, yet we acknowledge that God is not the only power in the world. God's will can be and often is thwarted. There are other powers at work, the powers of demonic forces, the powers of evil and death, which are often manifested in our own human behavior. Although God has won the ultimate victory over these powers through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the battle still rages on. Christ tells us to keep bringing our needs and hopes to God, trusting in God's loving purpose for us. We can affirm with what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8.28, where he says, In all things God works for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Other questions about prayer arise, such as, am I praying correctly? Or is this too small to pray about? In thinking this, we can also end up with a chronic sense of guilt, that you are not praying, and you're not, you're not praying correctly, or you're not being a good Christian if you were not doing it the right way. And because of this, we tell ourselves that we are failing, or worse yet, that we ourselves are failures. 
However, author Kathleen Norris suggests that we think of prayer much differently than what we've been taught, that the act of praying or prayer is not asking for what you think you want, but instead, prayer is asking to be changed in ways you can't imagine. Now, Martin Luther, in his explanation of the Lord's Prayer, says that we should enter God's presence with boldness, assured that God longs to have us converse with God, and that God desires to answer our prayers. All of this is to say that the essence of prayer is asking for and a willingness to enter into and remain in a relationship with God. Coming to God in prayer means that we come as we are. There is no waiting for the right time or the right place or that we have to be right with God or to be able to say that we have attained the correct position or status in life. The reality is, is that sometimes we come to God in prayer with anger, despair, a bad attitude in mind or spirit. But we need to understand that God always welcomes us into God's presence with open arms and a listening ear and a heart that wants only the very best for us. Nothing is too small for us to bring before God. God is interested in every area of our lives and is intimately involved in every aspect of it. Prayer is our way of having a relationship with God. And if we can accept that and work with God, not for God, but with God in that relationship, we will be changed in ways we can't even imagine. Luther's powerful perspective teaches that when we pray and ask God for things, we must prepare ourselves because what we are really asking for are for these things to change. And that change will often, if not always, need to begin with ourselves. Perhaps part of the truth of some unanswered prayer is that we ourselves are sometimes the answer to that prayer, but for whatever reason, we are neither willing nor capable of becoming that answer. So is prayer something we do or something we use? Or is prayer a gift? I think prayer is the gift of opportunity. We receive the chance to make our appeal before God. It is a gift that we can give in place of other material things that don't really offer comfort. But because prayer is the kind of gift that comes from the heart, it is the most meaningful. We pray completely and freely when we ask God's kingdom to come. We are asking that God's kingdom come to us so that we can live in God's kingdom here on earth and experience the abundant life that is, that is ours in that kingdom. When we ask that God's will be done on earth, we are asking that, it, that his will be done here and now. By asking for this, we are committing ourselves to being disciples of Jesus Christ and to place his will above our will. When we recognize God's perspective, then that perspective becomes our perspective. Because it is then that prayer is more than asking for something that we need. It is asking to be changed in ways that we cannot ever imagine. Now, as most of you probably know by now, this is my last worship time with you as your director of discipleship ministry. I have accepted a position to serve as a staff chaplain with Genesis Health Systems in Davenport. Now, words cannot express adequately enough what you all have meant to Allison and me over these last four years. I came here pretty green about ministry, yet you all loved and supported me 
as I journeyed through not only the development of the direct, director of discipleship ministry position, but in my journey through seminary as well. For all these things, I will be eternally grateful. You all have played very important roles in my journey and growth here at St. Paul. Now, there are just a few people I want to acknowledge because these folks are responsible for me, for me being here in the first place. And they have guided and mentored me throughout my time here. My heartfelt thanks go out to the first two people I met as I took my first steps into the life of this congregation. Donna Condry and Arlie Willems. Arlie and Donna were part of the human resources team four years ago. They were in charge of doing initial interviews with potential candidates for this position. Now I'll never forget the first interview I had with them. It took place in the CE building basement. And this is where they grilled me for what seemed to be hours on end. <laughs> and after, after the relentless questioning about my experiences and motivations that qualified me to be St. Paul's new director of discipleship ministry, as if that wasn't enough, they pulled out a spotlight and shined it into my eyes. I tried my best to answer their piercing questions, sometimes the same ones over and over again as if they were trying to trip me up. I begged for mercy. Afterwards, I fell into, the, into a heap, exhausted onto the floor. And if that weren't enough, they brought me back for a second interview, this time in front of select members of the church council. Now imagine what it was like for me to be further grilled, not only by Arlie and Donna again, but this time by the likes of Jan Copenhaver, Nicole Sander, Daryl Sechrist, and Pastor Katie. Well, after that, I thought I was a goner. There was no chance of me getting this job. However, God moves in mysterious ways. Lo and behold, they called me back for a third interview. Here, the barrage of unrelenting questions continued, this time by the likes of Paula Hartman, and yes, Nancy Lyon Douglas. Yes, I know it's hard to believe, but I wasn't fooled by her warmth and graciousness. I was prepared and waiting for another battle, but the battle never came. It was then that I was offered the position that I hold today. Four years later, I am still here. I wear the scars of those battles, but I am a better person for it. Now, all kidding aside, the St. Paul Council has been nothing but gracious and loving in its support for me, my ministry, my education, and my family. They will forever have my undying gratitude, and I will take with me the confidence they placed in me. And it is my intention to always be able to say, I honored, represented, and glorified God through the work of St. Paul. Donna and Arlie, I want to thank you. Thank you and DJ and Jay for the support, the respect, the understanding, the confidence and friendship that you've blessed me with. I am a changed man because of our relationship, and I hope to one day live into the confidence that you placed in me. Arlie, it is uh, really impossible to describe my gratitude for the incredible wisdom, support, and friendship that you've shown me and Allison. Your vision for the church is greatly needed, and this place is blessed to have you here despite your exhausting efforts to finally retire. And to Pastor Catherine, I offer my heartfelt thanks and gratitude for her support, encouragement, and help in focusing my direction in ministry. She not only understood the need for mental health ministry in the church, she embraced it and championed my efforts to bring this needed ministry to the forefront. To Pastor Katie, I offer an enormous debt of gratitude and thanks for her faith in me and my gifts. 
She was instrumental in giving me the opportunity to serve St. Paul and was the first to lift me up as I journeyed through the call to ministry. She continues to be an incredible example, friend, and mentor, and I cherish the mission that we work together. Thank you to Nancy, who never let a day go by without a hug and a smile. I will miss those hugs and smiles and the incredible unabashed love that she has for her God and for her church. She is one wonderful lady. And Lois, I want to thank you for all you do for St. Paul. You have a deep passion for what you do. And just by the way, Luther Seminary is now offering tuition-free MDiv degree programs. Just something to think about. And last but certainly not least, I thank you, Pastor Rodney. Pastor Rodney and I had a seminary class together a couple of years ago, which is when I first experienced his wit and wisdom and a passion for his call to ministry. Now, there were a few times when he liked to argue certain points in our Lutheran Confessions class. Imagine that. I remember thinking, who does this guy think he is? Never in a million years did I think that he would end up being my partner in ministry here. I have always admired your gifts of compassion, insight, the ability to listen, to be encouraging, supporting, affirming, and reminding others of the freedoms that they have as they search for their own spiritual gifts. I've admired your intellect, your sense of humor, and the easy and comforting way that you have with people. I have often thought that as much as I am grateful for the opportunity to be here, St. Paul really is in good hands with Pastor Rodney. I have cherished our ministry here together, but most of all, I cherish our friendship, which I know will continue beyond today. And finally to you, my friends, I thank you for everything, your support, <clears throat> your encouragement, your tolerance of sermons like this, your understanding, <clears throat> friendship, but most of all, for the steadfast love that you have for our God and for the mission of this church, this body of Christ that we call St. Paul Lutheran Church, Anamosa, Iowa. When I came here four years ago, I prayed to God to help me figure out my call to ministry. God has done that, and yet the journey will continue to have all kinds of forks and bumps in the road. But what God did do through St. Paul Lutheran Church is change me in ways I never could have imagined. God has richly blessed this place. And so now, therefore, go out into the world to creatively connect, intentionally grow, and joyfully serve. Thanks be to God.